Good morning everyone. Students, please settle down. May I request you to please put your cell phones on silent or switch it off. Thank you.
morning everyone on behalf of the sumaya trust management our provost professor pillai and the team of the sumaya initiatives for research and consultancy i am dr becky thomas and i will be your host for today welcome you all to this our campus it's a wonderful day we've been blessed with really heavy rains and i must thank our guest and both dr rajivan and dr kelkar and of course our imd deputy director general dr hosalika for this it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all for today's sumaya public lecture today's lecture is being delivered by a distinguished physicist dr m rajivan who is the secretary to the government of india in the ministry of earth sciences we are indeed privileged to have you amongst us dr rajivan as our guest of honor and who will be presiding over this talk is none other than dr ranjan kelkar dr kelkar is the former director general of the indian meteorological department he is also a teacher and mentor to many of our distinguished guests present here today we have amongst us dr krishnanand hosalikar the deputy director general of the indian meteorological department dr hosalikar is also our alumni of the kg sumaya college of science and commerce he is also an active collaborator on, on some of our ongoing research projects i welcome dr panditurai and his team from the indian institute of tropical meteorology pune and also our collaborators and staff from the indian meteorological department kolaba we are awaiting the arrival of our chairman mr samir sumaya and our secretary lieutenant general jagbir singh he, they will be here with us shortly we also have distinguished guests from sister institutes and related organizations thank you one and all for coming and gracing this occasion i must also inform you that we are live streaming this talk on youtube let's begin this day this function with our campus prayer may i now invite ms harita to please lead us in the campus prayer i request you all to please rise for the prayer ओम सहनावतु 
May I invite Dr. Rajivan? Yeah. Welcome our chairman, Mr. Samir Sumaya, and our secretary, General Jagbir Singh, for this day's function. May I invite Dr. Rajivan and Dr. Kelkar to please take their seat on the dais. Thank you. I now request. Thank you, sir. I now request our provost, Professor Pillay, to please welcome and introduce our speaker, Professor Dr. Rajivan, and also Dr. Kelkar, who's presiding over this lecture. Our Chairman, Mr. Samir Swamaya, our Chief Guest today, Dr. M. Rajivan, President of this function, Dr. Kelkar, my colleagues from the Swamaya Vidya Vihar institutions, colleagues, uh, invitees from the various departments and institutions under the Ministry of Earth Sciences in and around Mumbai. Dear students, other invitees, first of all, let me welcome all of you for this, pub this month's public lecture. As many of you know, Somaya Public Lecture Series is one of our prominent educational outreach programs intended to share scholarly insights on contemporary issues cutting edge research, scientific and technological innovation with the society at large. We bring <coughs> eminent teachers, researchers, educationists, scientists, writers, jurists, innovators, and social workers to offer an insider's view of their own <coughs> area of work to the cross-section of the society. This activity forms part of the efforts of the Somaya group of institutions to contribute knowledge, thought, leadership, and innovative ideas to the society at large in a, con in a contextualized way. The program showcases 
dynamic speakers through a number of community-focused talks across a range of disciplines, encouraging <coughs> constructive debate on issues of regional and global relevance. The speakers share their knowledge, network with the stakeholders, and ent entertain and inspire. We had a one-and-a-half-hour interactive session with the students and some of the researchers in the institutions and here and around with these eminent speakers in the morning. The Somaya group has been actively and responsibly engaged in education, health, social welfare, and promotion of culture for three generations. Starting with the first rural school in 1942, Somaya Vidyavar Trust was founded in 1959 to provide quality holistic education by Sri Karamshi Bai Jetabai Somaya, an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. He was honored by the nation by the conferment of Padma Bhushan for his service to the society in 2000. He lived by the principle that we must give back to the society multifold, believing that philanthropy has to be beyond giving out of funds. He founded and promoted a number of public institutions of national interest, including hospitals, education and cultural institutions in rural and urban India. His son, Dr. Shandilal K. Somaya, a philanthropist, an eminent industrialist, and an extremely visionary educationist, was always the guiding spirit and inspiration to Somaya group of institutions. An industrialist with sharp business acumen, the welfare and upliftment of Adivasis, Girivanvasis, and the downtrodden in the society was close to his heart and central his, to his core activities. Mr. Samir Somaya is the current president of Somaya Vidya Vihar and Somaya Ayur Vihar and a number of related uh, uh, trusts. He is the chairman of the overall Somaya Trust as well. Educated in Cornell and Harvard, Mr. Samir Somaya is a proponent of holistic education and believes in the power of education to enhance the quality of the life of the society. Today, Somaya Vidya Vihar encompasses 34 institutions, almost 40,000 students, and 1,500 teachers. Its educational institutes are spread across two main campuses, a 50-acre complex here in Vidya Vihar and a 28-acre complex in Sion, both located in the heart of Mumbai, besides a number of smaller and very relevant campuses across rural Maharashtra, Karnataka, and Gujarat. Currently, we offer degree, diploma, certificate courses at undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral level uh, under the Mumbai University, Maharashtra University of Health Sciences, and the Kavi Kuloguru Kalidas Sanskrit University. We are also in the process of transforming our uh, few of our institutions into a private university, which is under active consideration by the government of Maharashtra. We offer postgraduate courses. In addition to postgraduate courses, we also offer vocational training courses and we run a number of very good schools. It, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce briefly the speaker, Dr. M. Rajivan, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. I'm extremely glad that in spite of he has a parliament question today to attend, he, come, he stood to his commitment and he came here. Today is there is a parliament question on earth sciences, and he said there is a commitment to go to the institution. And thank you very much, Dr. Ajivan, for this excellent thing. Dr. Ajivan earned his BSc and MSc in physics from Madurai Kamaraj University, his PhD uh, from the University of Pune. Dr. Ajivan has contributed significantly for developing many application tools and prediction models for uh, societal applications such as long-range prediction models, uh, gridded uh, climate data sets, and many other climate application products for regional climate services. These models and application tools are being used by the India Meteorological Department for regular operational use. Dr. Rajivan was awarded the 2001 start uh, a young scientist award for the paper New Net Cloud Radiative Forcing at the Top of Atmosphere in the Asian Monsoon Region. 
He was also conferred an award for the young scientist in atmospheric sciences by the Ministry of Earth Sciences, New Delhi, in 2007, and for his research contributions in atmospheric sciences. Also, the 20th uh, <coughs> Biennial Mausam Award in 2001 by the Department of Science and Technology for, for his paper on radiative transfer model. Dr. Rajivan is honored by the fellowship of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, an expert member in the World Meteorological uh, Organization, WMO, International Panel on Climate Services and Information System under the Global Framework on Climate Services. He's, the, he's an, an associate editor of the Springer and Elsevier Journal, member of such a, uh, advisory committee. He's also on the editorial board of Current Science, the premier journal of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and in a number of national and international committees on earth sciences and climate change. It is our God, good fortune that he has accepted our invitation, and he's, he's going to speak on climate change, its implications, including social issues. This lecture is going to be presided over by a very eminent scientist, uh, the former Director General of uh, Indian Meteorological Department, Dr. Ranjan Kalkar, currently residing in Pune and very much in the, in, in, involved in meteorology and, and expert in satellite meteorology and its applications on uh, weather forecasting. He has many books published in, in, into his credit on meteorology, satellite meteorology, and monsoon. He also, in his, his credit, a book entitled Maharashtra Weather, written in Marathi. Dr. Kalkar has published extensively. He is the guru of many of the scientists who are, who are attending this conference, the, this lecture today, including, of course, uh, Dr. Rajivan. I, I take this opportunity to welcome you. I just called him. He was so happy to come over and accept the invitation to preside over the thing. Today, he, we had some sort of a insight shared with the students and researchers in the morning. Well, welcome. We have Dr. Hosalikar, Deputy Director General from the IMG. Of course, during one of our interactions in a, in a, in a, on a different subject, this idea occurred to me. I suggested that I will be inviting uh, Dr. Rajivan, whom I know, when I was heading the Science and Technology Department, uh, and we had also um, good interaction with uh, in establishing a national center for earth science studies in Trivandrum, uh, and he is the, even even now he continues to be the chairman of that organization. So uh, let me welcome Dr. Hasalikar and the entire team from the various departments of the Meteorological Department and other related institutions. Let me uh, welcome our chairman, Mr. Samir Somaya, uh, our secretary, General Jagbir Singh, and all my colleagues in the Somaya Vidya Vihar, my principals, my teachers, students, and the SVV staff and all other invitees for this public lecture function. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. May I now invite our chairman to felicitate our guests. Uh, I want to welcome Dr. Rajivan here, Dr. Kirkar. I want to compliment Dr. Pillai for his initiative of the public lecture series where he has been inviting very eminent scholars to our campus 
and also having them interact informally with the students and faculty earlier and then later in the form of a public lecture. So our dream is to create a world-class institution of learning, research, and service. Founded, as he said, in 1959, but the first foundations were laid in 1942 as a small Zilla Parishad kind of school in rural Maharashtra that was done in, in uh, and then now we have about 40,000 students and we want to create something. Often we are told, even yesterday I was at a, a dinner, uh, not at a dinner, at the Indian Merchants Chamber and a member asked me that uh, if you become a private university, will you tie up with another international university? And I said, no, kaam to sabke saath karna hai, lekin azadi se karna hai. Ek ki gulami chhodke, dousre ki gulami nahi leni hai. We want to, and I said, rasta mushkil hoga, lamba hoga, lekin tay hum khud karenge, logo se sikhenge zarur, aage badte jayenge, taklifi aayengi, mushkilay padengi, lekin tay azadi se, खुद करेंगे और अपने देश का नाम पूरे विश्व में फैलाएंगे नमस्कार थैंक यू सो मच सर मे आई इनवाइट आवर गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर डॉक्टर केलकर ही सेड ही वांटेड टू स्पीक अ फ्यू वर्ड्स बिफोर वी स्टार्ट विद द पब्लिक लेक्चर Good morning, everybody. Mr. Samir Somaya, Professor Pillay, Dr. Rajivan, General Singh, Dr. Hosarikar, and Dr. Becky Thomas in the hiding behind me, and members of the audience, distinguished guests. Let me begin by saying that I'm extremely happy to be here on this rainy day, especially in Mumbai, something that we have been waiting for. And uh, I'm thankful to Professor Pillay for inviting me here to this place. I've been watching your public lectures on YouTube, but to be in front of the camera here is something very different. So I'll be going back and looking at it, how I look like. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm eager to hear Dr. Rajivan as eager as all of you are. So I, I promise I won't speak too long. I'll be brief. Just last week in Pune, I've been invited to a meeting to discuss the National Education Policy Draft 2019. Not much to do with it. I little expected to, to speak much there, but somebody noticed me in the crowd and said, let's hear about the monsoon first. So before education, the monsoon comes in, and I spoke a little. Eventually, the discussion went to climate change, global warming, air pollution, ecology, and so on. And what we thought was, that the real education should start at the school level about all these issues and awareness should be created in the new education policy on matters like these. So I'm really glad that Dr. Rajivan has chosen to speak today about uh, global climate change and its implications on sectors like agriculture, water resources, health and energy. The warming of the globe was first noticed or discovered some 25 years back, uh, but since then, no, it, was, it has not remained a problem in meteorology per se. It's a different uh, exercise, interdisciplinary advance, that transcends the boundaries of science into politics, economics, sociology, and the like. So it's not surprising that while the study of climate change has earned recognition of the highest order, that it got the Nobel Prize in 2007. But the Nobel Prize in 2007 was not given for physics, or for chemistry, or even for economics. It was given for peace. This is something which is to be noted, that climate change is no longer a scientific issue, which is to be dealt with by scientists alone. If you want peace in this world, in the world of the future, address climate change first. This is the message of the Nobel Prize for Peace. So it is something that concerns uh, the whole of humanity, and that's why today's lecture is extremely pertinent and contemporary. As far as the speaker is concerned, sir, I am not in a position to welcome you. I am myself a guest. So 
I'm not doing that. You also been introduced a little by Professor Pillay, so I'm not repeating that. Well, let me say that I had the privilege of knowing today's speaker since long, since very long, in fact. And since he was a budding scientist in IMD, I had the privilege of knowing him. So it's with a little sense of pride that I present the speaker to you as Secretary Ministry of Earth Sciences, Chairman Earth Commission, Chairman Earth System Science Organization. These posts sum up what he is. But more than that, I'll say that he's a hardcore scientist, He's a policy maker, and he's a bridge between science and society. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rajiva. Can we move? Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah. So you want to sit on the couch? You want to sit on the couch? You want to sit on the couch? Yeah. Okay. So we begin with the Sumaya public lecture, which is titled Global Climate Change, Causes, Concerns, and Commitments by Dr. M. Rajivan. Dr. Rajivan. Good morning, all of you. I respected uh, Sri Sameh Sumaya, Chair Chairman, Professor uh, Rajshigarin Pillai, Dr. Dunjan Kilkar, and Lieutenant General Jagbir Singh, and distinguished uh, faculty of Somaya institutions, and uh, students, and uh, probably the media people. I'm extremely happy to be here, and I should really thank uh, Dr. Swami uh, Somaya as well as Professor Dasir and Pillai for inviting me to this prestigious Education Institute for giving a public lecture. I feel very proud of it, and uh, even in spite of my uh, busy schedule, I came to I came to Bombay to join this uh, important event. I have another uh, attachment to Bombay because uh, just after my MSc, I joined Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. I worked here for two years, so I started earning money for bread and butter from Bombay. I have a lot of respect for this city, and it's a beautiful city. to see that they are addressing so many issues related to climate change, environment, and also they are talking about mobile applications for farmers. I am very happy to see that at the young age they started talking about all these social issues. And as I promised to Professor Dasha and Pillai that uh, our Ministry of Health Sciences will be very happy to provide support for any initiative. change. If you are setting up a center, we will be very happy to support you. I have a few words to talk about our uh, Professor Dr. R. R. Kelker. As he said that I have worked with him, he was my boss. He was my super boss once. And uh, what I enjoyed working with him, he always engaged me. I was very young and he always engaged me. And given a lot of touch to me and I uh, really worked uh, very hard. Uh, whatever uh, assignments he has given, I have performed very well. And I should really thank him. I have a lot of respect for him and I should really thank him. I would make, make use of this opportunity to thank him for all the support he has given and the engagement he has given in my career in the uh, India Department. So I will be now talking about uh, uh, the global climate change. I will take about 35-40 minutes, maybe even less than that. And uh, if you have a question, so I, will, I, I request that you please keep it for the end of the presentation so that I am not interrupted during my presentations. But I will be happy to answer your questions.
As all of you know that climate change is a major issue. Every year people are talking about climate change. As Dr. Kilker was mentioning that uh, climate change is nothing but uh, not, more, not mere science now. It is, uh, there, are, there are courses in economics of climate change in many universities to teach about the, what is the role of economics in climate change. People are talking about climate change <coughs> adoption, adaptation and mitigation, then a lot of economics will come. So I'll be basically uh, talking about most of science and little about uh, what will be the impact of climate change, especially relevant for a uh, country like India. You know, the whole Earth system consists of five spheres, and uh, we call us. Uh, so I can uh, move there and speak. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can call my yes. Hope I am audible to all of you. And we have a earth system in which uh, there are five spheres we call its atmosphere, hydrosphere. Hydrosphere is nothing but water. It can consist of ocean as well as rivers and all. Lithosphere is the core earth, solid earth. Cryosphere is nothing but uh, snow, ice and all. And biosphere is nothing but uh, basically the forest and all. So life exists anywhere, nearly everywhere on earth because the climate is, our earth's climate is very favorable. And uh, how about this, all these five, five spheres are not independent, they interact with each other, especially non-linearly. So it's a very complex system, very complex natural system. So if you really want to do anything about atmosphere, we should know what is the ocean. And if you really want to do anything of ocean, we should know atmosphere and other systems. So it's a very complex uh, yes, system. And uh, these are some of the components. We get energy basically from sun. Sun is the main source of our energy. And these are all some of the activities which we do in, on the earth. And this atmosphere, this a lot of, we emit a lot of gases, for example, and uh, volcanoes, so that's all natural activities. And there are rivers, and there are, for example, there are forests, there are glaciers, there's a lot of human influence in this system. So we have to really to understand the climate change, we need to understand all these components very, very in detail. So what is the, well, we are talking about uh, the global warming. So what is the cause for global warming? And I'll just describe in a uh, uh, couple of minutes. Now, as I said that uh, the energy from the sun is the main source of uh, uh, energy for the sun, uh, sorry, for the earth system. So we receive uh, energy from sun, but any, any body will be emit also emitting radiation back. And so air system also will be emitting radiation for some in long wave radiation. And so there is a balance, whatever energy is coming, the same kind of energy will be emitted back to space, outer space. So there is a kind of equilibrium between what is incoming and what is outgoing. So the temperature is maintained. So that's why we have always, always we have a very equilibrium temperatures. So any, any disruption in this income, either incoming or outgoing radiation will affect the equilibrium and it can alter the equilibrium and can alter the temperatures, ultimately the temperatures. And uh, so I will talk about uh, why it is, uh, the equilibrium is not, uh, uh, it is getting affected mainly because of the so-called uh, the effect is called a greenhouse effect. So in the atmosphere there are a lot of greenhouse gases which can really uh, block the long wave radiation or the earth's radiation going out from the space. If that radio, the gases concentration goes up, the more and more energy will be trapped back within the earth's atmosphere and it will, it will lead to the warming. So that's where the global warming is happening. So this gas allows the solar radiation to, to come inside, but they don't allow the Earth's radiation to go back to the space. It's almost like in a, in a vessel with a boiling water, you put a lid, the energy will not go out, the vapor the energy and all will not go. This is almost like a similar kind of thing. So the atmospheric gases will similarly really trap this long wave radiation or Earth's radiation, and ultimately the equilibrium, equilibrium is altered, and finally the temperatures goes up. That is the basic uh, uh, principle of uh, global warming. And what are the gases we are talking about uh, in the atmosphere is nothing but water vapor. But water vapor is nothing but it's a natural gas. It's not emitted by any human activities. It's basically a natural process. And But it is a greenhouse gas. And uh, main activities, uh, which uh, human activities which contribute greenhouse, increase in greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, Methane, ozone, and nitrous oxide. These are the four, four gases which we are worried about and mainly. Of course, carbon dioxide has the maximum impact. And what are the activities which they contribute to increase in the greenhouse gases are basically industrialization. More, more and more industries are coming up. It can emit all this kind of carbon dioxide, methane in the atmosphere. Deforestation, if you remove the forest, you can get uh, increase in the uh, greenhouse gases. 
and also public transport. Public transport also emits a lot of greenhouse gases and also land use changes. You know that we are going on changing the land use uh, and we are, we are from male farmlands, we are changing into different kind of activities. So that also activities also can change the emission of greenhouse gases. So I will give you some example how much uh, carbon dioxide and methane and all change. This is a record of thousands of years. It's, it's, uh, it's all observational data. And we take the old, uh, old data from uh, greenhouse gases from, we have a science called paleoclimate. We take ice cores, for example, we go to Antarctica, take the ice core, and we can find out how much the carbon dioxide was there a few years back, thousands of years back. So we have a record of this kind of record. You can see that at the end, you can see that at the end, you can see that it's, all, it's almost like carbon dioxide person, it's almost like a stationary value. It's, it's not changing. But last few years, you can see that it's sudden sharp rise, last few years. So there's a big change in everywhere in uh, carbon dioxide as well as in the uh, methane as well as in other uh, greenhouse gases. I will show the last uh, 2,000 years. You can see that it's all straight lines, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. But last few years, you can see that it is a beautiful uh, short price of all. It's all mainly because of our, our own human activities. And this is uh, a systematic observation of carbon dioxide started in mid nine, early 1960 um, by a person called uh, Charles David Keeling. He's a very famous person. He has set up an observatory in uh, Hill in Hawaii called Mauna Loa. It's a very famous observatory called Mauna Loa Observatory. He started very systematic observations of carbon dioxide concentration and earlier it was, it used to be less than 300 to 320 ppm. Now it has already crossed 410, almost 450 ppm. There's a sharp increase in the carbon dioxide concentration. If anybody is talking about, no, the carbon dioxide is not a big issue, we can always show this diagram and show, tell him that the carbon dioxide is increasing. And you can see that there's a small variation up and down in the the graph that is basically the, the biology. The forests are going up, forest is drying up in the summer, and the forests also take up some carbon dioxide which is emitted from the, in the atmosphere. So this is basically an uh, annual cycle we call. But uh, within the annual cycle, we have a low, big increase in the carbon dioxide concentration. So there is no doubt that greenhouse gases are increasing. And now, because of the global warming and because of the changes in the greenhouse gases, what we have really observed, are there any, really are there any changes in the climate system? The answer is yes, there are a lot of changes. And normally the changes can come because of the internal causes or external causes. Internal causes means, external causes mean it can, for example, climate system can change if the intensity of solar radiation is changing. And if orbital parameter, you know the earth is rotating, if any changes in the orbital parameter of the earth, like eccentricity or axial precession, everything is changing, and that also can cause the changes in the climate system. And all the, even the rotation of the Earth, if changes, it can also cause the... But as all of you know that the solar radiation is constant. It doesn't change except for 11-year solar cycle, which is very small. And orbital parameter changes, but it changes in 10,000 or 30,000 years of time. So basically, the external cause of, uh, causes for climate change is very, very less. So what are the changes we are observing mainly because of the internal causes? And internal causes, there are two, 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 uh, two kinds of internal causes. One is natural variability. Human need not contribute anything. Still, you can have a change in the climate system, mainly because of the natural processes. One natural process I can easily give you is a volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruption is not caused by human beings. It's a natural process. But that can really affect the climate, at least for a temporary period, short period. It may not have a longer period effect. But it can shorter period like volcanic effect can, and also continental drift. The continents are drifting, and that can also cause some changes in the in the process, the climate change. But the main activities which is really contributing the big changes in the climate system is anthropology. Anthropology is nothing but is human activities. The variation in the atmospheric composition, especially the carbon dioxide, ozone, aerosol loading, etc., due to human activity, really changes the. And also, as I told, the land surface properties, if you change the, the land use changes, if you make a lot of changes, changes in the land use, then that also can cause a lot of changes in the uh, climate system. And I will skip this. And uh, so, if you, do you have observations to show that climate system has changed? Yes, we have 
um, good observation system. We have a global observation of temperature, humidity, rainfall for the last 150 years or so. It's a very systematic observation we, we people are taking it, including India. And this is the beautiful example of uh, showing how much Earth has warmed up. And it's a global uh, picture. Again, it's, of course, this in foreign, foreign, uh, foreign heat. And this is per century. You can see that the Eurava red dog are there all warming. And you can see most of the planet is warming. That's number one. And the warming is more, especially in the polar regions, in the close to polar regions. And we call it, especially in the Arctic region, and we call it Arctic amplification. The warming is much more than what we observe in the, in the tropical regions. But many places are warming. Even India is warming up. And I will show you another uh, figure to show how much is warming over in. This is a global picture again. And if you really convert the temperatures into anomalies and plot it, you can see the last 50 years, of 1970 onwards, there is systematic rise in the global. This is a globally average temperature. 10,000 of observations we take just to take an average. And if you plot it, it will look like that. And you can see that it's a very systematic change in the temperature pattern and very clearly says that the global warming is happening. If somebody says that global warming is not there, you should show this figure and say that how oh, oh, you can explain it. There's no, there's, it's, it's, there's a lot of truth in that and many people initially started complaining about the quality of observations and all. And no more, it's all valid, it's all beautiful observation, well validated, calibrated observations. And so on manual observations, not taken by instrument, it is taken by instrument, but it is taken by human being. We go there in manual observation. Everywhere in the globe we take manual observations and it's all good observations. So that very clearly shows that it's a warming is taking place. And if you really, each year if you take an anomaly and plot it in terms of ranking, how much the warming is. For example, this year it will be 0.8 degree above normal, next year it will be 0.2. You start putting in the descending order and you will see all these recent years are warmest years, especially after 2000, 2000, 2001, 2, 3, 4, uh, 14, 15, these are all the warmest years. And uh, also this is the land use changes I told that in uh, 1750, this is the way uh, India, sorry, the whole world looked like. And in uh, 1990, you can see the lot of changes, especially the agriculture uh, activities have increased everywhere. You can see Europe, U US, as well as India. A lot of changes in the land, in the land use properties. These are all taken from uh, satellite observations in 1990s. And uh, so what are the implications? Now, well, not only temperature, so it has implication in many other aspects of the global climate system. One is uh, sea level is rising. Over our ocean surface, sea level is rising. Because if sea, the water is, the sea water is nothing but a liquid. Any temperature increase can expand the water. So it is basically thermal expansion happens, and mostly it is thermal expansion. So the thermal expansion can really rise the water level. So thermal expansion is causing the sea level rise, and it is also recorded by observations. We call tide gauges. There are plenty of tide gauges around the world. So if you take average of all these things, you get a beautiful graph which shows that sea level is rising. And another is the ocean heat content. The ocean heat content I means how much heat is contained within the ocean system. First, for some the first 100 meter, if you go down, temperature decreases. But you can take the first 100 meter and take the average of temperature and multiply rho CP and all. Then you can get the heat content in joules. And that, if you really plot it, you can see the beautiful changes in the uh, ocean heat content. The so ocean is the so ocean temperatures is going up. Not only the surface temperature, but the whole ocean is warming up. Not only at the surface level, even at the depth, at different depths, the temperatures are going up. So, for well, the ocean, whole ocean heat content is going up. And this is if, you, if you, carbon dioxide is more emitted in the atmosphere, oceans absorb carbon dioxide. Some of the uh, carbon dioxide emitted is absorbed by us. Because of more and more carbon dioxide is absorbed, so it has an uh, acidification. Ocean is becoming more and more acidic. The pH values is decreasing, so it is becoming more and more acid now. And uh, major impact is on Arctic sea ice. The Arctic region, there are a lot of sea ice, and especially in uh, their winter, they have a lot of sea ice. And sea ice start melt melting sometime, sometime in September every year. And uh, so it's a sharp price. This, this red color shows is all. 
this red color clearly shows the, these are all satellite observations, very calibrated, good observations of satellite observations, we cannot uh, deny on that. So, and you can see that beautiful observation very clearly shows that very rapid in decrease in the sea, sorry, the sea ice, the whole, whole sea ice of Arctic is melting. And if these are the blue lines are, what will happen in the future, we see in climate models, we could predict what will be the changes in the sea ice. And it is, it is something like that, it, by 2050, we will have an Arctic uh, Ocean without any sea ice, that will be wonder. There will be an uh, sea, Arctic, Arctic Ocean in 2050 or 60, in which there will be no sea ice. That will be a very disastrous event which is going to take place, and people are all uh, geared for this kind of event. And now question is, uh, oh, okay, all these temperature changes are happening, it could be that just natural variability because we have only last 150 years of data. So people can question, uh, yeah, we lived in this uh, earth for last what, billions of years or 50,000 of years. It must have happened in the past. We don't know the data because uh, uh, systematic observations started about 150 years back, 1850s or so. And the question is uh, that, that some people really talk about whether this could be just a natural variability. It's not contributed by human being. Don't blame anybody. Don't blame industries. So we have done, a, we have been scientists have done an exercise to see whether it is, how much is the influence by human activity. There is an organization called the IPCC, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, in which India is a part of the panel, and it's a full of scientists, it's a, and, uh, maybe about 450, 500 people, this get together, and always they make, every four years they make a report. This is a 2007 report, they very clearly told that the warming, so far what we observed is mainly because of the human activities. I'll just explain why it is. And uh, if, uh, as I told that you fix the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is increasing. You fix the carbon dioxide 320 or 300 and you can use climate models to project how much this temperature change can happen. If we assume that carbon dioxide is fixed, you don't change it every year, then you will get this kind of graph. And this black, the black guy is basically the observations. And you can see the observations on the recent years is much more than what we will get if you assume that carbon dioxide is fixed. Only if you include the increase in the carbon dioxide, you, will, you can get a temperature which is very close to observation. Which clearly demonstrates that human activity is increasing the carbon dioxide and that the increase in the carbon dioxide is really causing the global warming. So it is beyond the natural variability and it is all mainly caused by human activities. You know, what, what, so these are all global pictures and what is happening in India? India also temperatures are increasing everywhere, warming is taking place. This is the spatial pattern of how much warming is taking, except for small areas over here as well as here. Otherwise temperatures are going up and almost 0 0.7, 0 0.75 degree last 100 years, which is very close to the global average. So India also warming up much faster and whereas uh, as far as monsoon rainfall which is basically nothing but bread and butter for all of us fortunately uh, it's very good news is this monsoon system is very robust so far we did not see any long term changes in the at least for a rainfall average for the whole country it is very very robust you can see it's not many changes it's only year to year variation you have but no long term trend but there are some places where rainfall is changing for example over this area rainfall is decreasing and over, uh, even including Kerala, Kerala is getting less and less rainfall every year. But states like Maharashtra, parts of Karnataka, even Gujarat, and even uh, Jammu Kashmir, the rainfall is increasing. So there are regional changes, but if you take an all India average, you will get the monsoon is very robust, very stable system. We are lucky to have a monsoon, a robust monsoon system. And if temperature, if a really a, a any change in the mean pattern, so I, what we are talking about changes in the mean system, if you are changing the main system, if you really put a simple statistics, assume that the whole distribution is in the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution, what we get is the extremes will increase. A small change in the mean pattern will change the, you can see that, small change in the normal distribution. If you change it to a right, right hand side a little bit, but you can see the extremes will increase. So what is, so what is the impact of uh, changes in the mean temperature of the globe is you will get more and more extremes. That's very, very clear. I'll give a few examples, especially over India. These are droughts, a time series of droughts. This is nothing but the percentage of area affected by droughts in the country. 
and the, and the drought can be faster. The drought can last about six months. Some droughts can last for 12 months. Some maybe even two years. So if you average, if you find out different uh, droughts of different periods, you see a very systematic increase everywhere. So all kinds of droughts is increasing. The increase in the area affected by the drought is definitely it is increasing for the last few years over the country. And you can see very visible, uh, very much visible in the Maharashtra. For the last two years, uh, Maharashtra is experiencing very severe uh, water, water stress as well as drought conditions. And another is a heavy rainfall. How much intensity of rainfall that is increasing? And there's a beautiful uh, uh, data which very clearly shows the last few years the frequency of the heavy rainfall events. Well, for example, 24 hours, it may rain 10 centimeters, but now it is raining much more in a particular, it's in the same period, 24 hours. The frequency of uh, heavy rainfall is increasing. Another is the rainstorms. You must be remembering this famous uh, photo. This is in Kedarnath. The last year, about the 13, uh, the 2013, this happened. And uh, this is the Jammu Kashmir floods. So this kind of rainstorms, uh, basically the flood events also increasing. We can give an example. We analyzed a few years of data and we found that beautiful increase in rainstorm days as well as the rainstorm events. So this kind of flood events also is increasing in the country. And another is a heat wave. This is a 2003 European heat wave. You may be aware, you may be knowing that there at present there's a lot of heat waves happening in a country like France and people are dying. This happened in 2003. It's a very famous heat wave. It, uh, least of thousands of papers have come out to discuss how it happened, in which about 40,000 people died. In a developed country like France and Germany, 40,000 people died simply because of heat wave. And, uh, and this kind of events are also increasing. In the, over India, this is the area where we normally get heat wave. Maharashtra is not much affected, but many other areas which affected over heat waves. And if you really see the heat wave events at different places, many places, the heat wave frequency is going up. So very, very, very important results. And so now the question is, these are all what we observe. The basic question is, well, these are all observed, we probably it may not continue, whether it will continue and how, how much the intensity will change in the future, how much the climate change system will change in the future. For that, we have only one solution, what we can do is, we have climate models and we call earth system model, which will, I shown a map in which all the earth system components are shown. So we can mathematically do a modeling of all these components in terms of physics as well as mathematics as well as chemistry. And you can predict this kind of events, how it is going to change in the future. So but that's what we call S system modeling. And our institute in Pune, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, has a center called Center for Climate Change Research. They already developed the S system model, which is basically a three-dimensional model. For, the, for running the model, we need huge computer. We have high-performance computers or supercomputers of a 10 petaflop speed. And use those computers to run the simulations to see for some next 50 years, what will be happening in the climate system. And I'll show some few examples. I said, oh, this is the climate uh, system. And so we have to model everything in terms of physical equations, mathematical equations, as well as physics, uh, all these components. And, and also it's interactions. So this is done in the model called a system model. And so this is the first uh, system model which we developed a few years back, a couple of years back. It's still going on. And as I told that IPCC is an, an international agency where we contribute our results. And never in the past, we have so, so far five reports were published by IPCC. In the past five reports, India never contributed to any results. What are the results discussed in the IPCC reports were based on the models developed by somebody else, mostly by US people. And there were a lot of criticism, so IPCC model, IPCC results cannot be agreed or cannot be believed because these are biased by Westernized, they are biased by West US people because our own contribution is not there. That's why we started developing our own model. And next uh, IPCC report, which will come in 2021, other model results will come. This is the first time in India's model results will be included in the IPCC report, which will be a kind of breakthrough. So then we can believe, we can, we can say that in the IPCC report, our own results are there. So please start believing these reports. So that's the purpose of this. this. is a huge work which we are doing it now. And I will few, I'll give a few examples how what will be our future. This is, uh, so now question is, when we want to predict the future climate, how will we assume that carbon dioxide will change? 
So that all, so we have, they have identified different scenarios. Assume that whatever we are emitting, we will assume continuity emit. That means present activities definitely will continue. If you are doing some factor, if you are in increasing the industry level, the same industry level increase will happen. Uh, another, another assumption we can make is we will put short, very strict conditions of emission of carbon dioxide. For after a few years, we can reduce it. So we have different scenarios. After each scenario, we can find out what will be the changes in the climate system. So these are different scenarios. Each color uh, pertains to different scenario. And whatever scenario is there, the warming of temperature over India is very much certain. So the temperature is going to go up and uh, probably by 2100, about 2 degree warming, if you assume that everything is going well. And we normally call business as usual. Whatever business is going, it will go. So if we, if we assume that kind of scenario, then we will get about 2 degree warming in the whole country. And another important aspect is, uh, and uh, of course, I'll, but uh, as, as I told this, monsoon rainfall, this is the monsoon rainfall picture, which very clearly says there will not be any changes in the monsoon system. So we will have a robust monsoon, which we should be very happy. So we will get water, a lot, a lot of water. Only thing we should conserve water and make use of very efficiently. Otherwise, we are, after one good monsoon, we will say there is no water. So we should have good water management system. That's a different issue. But we will be blessed with uh, good monsoons in the future also. We should not worry much. But definitely temperature is going to go up. And another important thing is the, the cold nights, the nights with very cold temperature is going to come down and warm, warm nights and warm days are going to increase. So we have more and more warm days but cold nights, so the cold temperatures is going to go down. So probably the people who are making the sweater center will have less business in the future. That's the meaning of that. And of course I will keep all this, this also shows the same results. So basically, so, the, so the, all these climate models, I will just summarize it, but it very clearly shows, of course, one I, I should really clearly tell you that whatever the model projections are being made, all may not be true. But there are a lot of uncertainty in the model projections because there is a lot of approximation we make in the, in the mathematical, even if it's a mathematical model, we make a lot of approximation. Because of approximation, there are a lot of uncertainties. Because of uncertainties, you cannot believe in anything. For example, at regional level, if you make, for example, there are a lot of theories, a lot of newspaper reports saying that Maldives will go underwater, Lashadi will undergo water. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Okay, that's just scary people if they will tell a lot of things, but some of the things we have to believe. And so this is called uncertainty. So three, two, three things are very visible and very clearly we have a lot of confidence in saying is only temperatures will go up and heat wave events, frequency of heat wave events will go up definitely over Indian region. And another is the monsoon rainfall, as even though it is stable, the he heavy rainfall event, the intense rainfall event, like Bombay we had 2005, we had a f severe flood, that kind of events will increase. And the, the, the dry spell, you know, every, every at a particular station, all 20, all 122 days it doesn't rain, all 365 doesn't rain, it doesn't rain. It, does, it, it rains only a few days. And in, uh, in monsoon season, all 122 days, all 122 days we don't get rain. So we have the so-called spells with the grain, then when we have spells without the rain, that, that we call dry spells and we have wet spells. Now what is going to happen is the, the length of the dry spell is going to increase and the length of the dry, wet spell is going to decrease. But the total rainfall will remain same. So the meaning is when it rains, it rains very, very heavily. So the total amount is same, but the dry spells will increase. So this will have a serious impact in terms of agriculture practices. So the farmer should really know when it is going to rain, it will rain only a few days. So you make use of that water. And the dry spells will be long. Instead of four days or five days of long dry spells, you will have ten days of dry spells. So agricultural farmers will have serious impact. So we should be able to teach them properly and they should be able to adapt the, this kind of changes in their farming operations. If you don't mind, I will take a little water. I'll try to finish it in the next 10 days, uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 minutes. Yeah. So, so, so recently uh, IPCC was asked by government, so uh, as I told them that the model projections are showing 2 degree warming is going to happen. 
And the question is, two degree warming will have serious implications, serious replications. So all people, all governments have come up and they asked the IPCC, you, you try to find out if the warming is can be reduced to 1.5 degrees instead of 2 degree. What could be the changes which we can see? So they did a big exercise. Recently, a couple of months back only this report was uh, published. It's called 1.5 degree report by IPCC. They made a lot of climate change simulations. And instead of warming 2 degree, instead of assume that warming is only 1.5 degree, what could be the changes? And so these are some of the examples they showed. For example, if you, if you assume that this, temp this is a so-called absurd temperature, if you assume that temperature is going up, it will go around by 2040 or 50, we will cross 1.5 degree. And it will still continue by 2100, but to reduce the emissions such that by 2100, the warming is restricted to around 5 degrees. So that's a big exercise. And also they try to analyze the impact. I will read a little bit, maybe one or two slides I will read. Uh, the one is the one part, the climate related risk for natural and human systems are higher for global warming of 1.5 degree than at present, which is very true, but lower than at 2 degrees. So it is better always to try to restrict at 1.5. This risk depends on the magnitude and rate of warming, geographic locations. So it can be different at different locations. A level of levels of de development and also vulnerability. Vulnerability is very, very important. So the warming, even the one degree warming for the particular place in the Sahara Desert, don't we don't bother. We let it warm there. But the one degree warming in Bombay is it is very well, highly vulnerable. But people are living here. So this so it is not only really, it is not uniformly you cannot apply. You should really see how many people and what is the status of people. Whether people are poor, people can afford, for example, food, people can afford water. That also will be playing an important role. And uh, another important thing is, of course, the 1.5 degree will also by uh, by reducing the 1.5 degree, the water sorry the sea level rise will be little less than 0.1 meter. So we can reduce only 0.1 meter. So the, the, the advantage of reducing it to 1.5 degree, there are not many advantages, but definitely it is less than what we, we can expect from 2 degree warming. And so I will move on to the impacts of climate. So if it's all happening, so what will happen? What will happen to agriculture? What will happen to health? What will happen to water, energy, and disasters? I will not go in detail. But definitely this climate change, the project, what, is, uh, what we are observed, what we are projecting in the future climate, will have serious implications in all these sectors. Health will have definitely, the temperatures are going up, less rains, so it will have effect in, uh, for example, vector bone diseases, if heavy rainfall events are happening, vector bone diseases are happening. And you may be remembering, you may be hearing the news of Bengal, sorry, Bihar children dying. And one reason they are attributing is the extraordinary high temperatures over that region. So it will have serious implication in health. Agriculture, of course, it will be, as I told that, the number of rain, rainfall events are reducing. And when it rains, it rains heavily. You have a, draw, a long uh, dry spell. So it will have an implication in agriculture and also water and also energy. And, of course, uh, natural disasters also will have important role. I will not go in detail. This itself is a... A very, very uh, a lot of research is going on. It will take a lot of time for me to explain, but definitely we, you should uh, remember that there, there can be a lot of effect on all these sectors. This I want to show you. This is just a cartoon made by people just to show that this is. You see that US is a little expanded. The for top figure it shows how much carbon dioxide, how, how much greenhouse gas is emitted by people, different countries, proportional to their emission the country is expanded or reduced. This is the top. So you can see that US is emitting more, Europe is emitting more, and China is emitting more. But when it comes to the effect on health, it is just to, ultra, just to make America don't have, will not have any problem. South America will not have any problem. Europe will not have the problem will be in poor countries like Africa, Asia. So somebody else is emitting, but the health effect will be more seen in poor countries like Africa and Asia. This is very a big irony, and we should really understand this kind of issues. So Americans are not worried because their health issues won't be affected, but they can go on emitting greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, etc. But somebody else will be getting affected. This is a very serious uh, issue which people are normally discuss it. So I will move on that. Now, 
how much the carbon dioxide, how much contribution from different gases. Basically, as I told, the carbon dioxide is the main, and uh, and what are the different industries which are contributing? Uh, basically, it is for electricity industry, transportation, buildings, other energy, food and land use. These are the, some of the areas which they uh, uh, areas or sectors which they contribute to increase in the greenhouse gases. I will talk about India's role. If you take all the global countries and how much India contributes. India contributes about 6% of carbon dioxide emission from the fuel emission, combustion. You see, we are in third place after US and China. But per capita emission is much less than the world average. Because now we have plenty of people, so that if you take everything together, we are third in emission. But if you take, if you take the whole global emission divided by the population, we are very, very less. So per capita emission is very less. We are poor country. We have, we, we, our people are not emitting. But America still, the per capita is very, very high. And including countries like Arab, Arab nations, they contribute much more than India for in, per, in, per, in terms of per capita. So when these uh, dialogues or discussion come, uh, and uh, especially on emitting, uh, restricting the global emissions of carbon dioxide and other gases, we always say that they, they, Western countries they normally blame China and India. For, ev for everything of global warming, because you, are, you people are emitting. But they don't understand per capita emission of India is very much less. So we also, of course, bargain for so our own uh, role, and we say that we don't emit too much, because our population is more than we are emitting more. But per capita emission is very, very high in Western countries. And what are different countries, different uh, uh, emission from India is 68% uh, of the emission is from the energy, energy sector from India, in India. And uh, 19.9, almost 20 percent is from industry, and a few other uh, small number. So basically, the uh, mostly mostly it is from energy sector which we are emitting more, mainly because we burn a lot of coal. We have a lot of thermal plants in the country to generate electricity. That is contributing more in the country. So government has uh, given a lot of in, to, in the Paris uh, Agreement. We have given a lot of commitments. We, even though we understand that our per capita emission is very less, but the Indian government has taken very, very serious action and very serious step in spite of our own problem. We have almost still 20% of the population is below poverty line. We have plenty of problems in our country, but still we, to, we have to develop. We have deemed a development. We cannot say that you now global warming is happening, so we will not eat half roti. We will not have a good house. We will not have electricity. We cannot tell. We, our people also have to live a comfortable life. So in spite of that kind of commitments, India government took a very, 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 very systematic commitment. They told that to reduce the whole global warming or climate change aspect, they have made a beautiful uh, commitment. It's called Intendant Nationally Determined Contribution, which they have determined. And they have com communicated to UN bodies. And what they will do is they, they will reduce the emission intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35 percentage by 2030 from the 2005 level. That means they are going to reduce the fossil fuel emission or combustion by 2030. And 40% of cumulative electric power installed capacity is from the non-fossil fuel based energy resources. Now the only 20% of the total energy is produced is non-conventional energy like wind and solar energy. And that they are going to make it 40%. That means the, the energy used by coal, etc. will be reduced. That's what their commitment. Because that is all, uh, the uh, wind and solar is green energy. It doesn't emit any carbon dioxide or any methane. So we should go on moving, moving to more and more use of uh, alternate energy sources or green energy like wind and solar. And uh, and also we have uh, we have committed that uh, as I told that uh, bio, 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 bio system, biosphere, or forest also absorb carbon dioxide. That's why all, people, all, of, all of us, we tell people that don't remove the forest, don't remove the trees. The trees and forests will play an important role in absorbing carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. So we should preserve as much as possible the forest in the country. So what they are trying to do is they want to create this carbon sink. Sink means nothing but the places where the carbon dioxide will be absorbed from 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide. So that they are also determined. No, India is, as I will briefly mention about what is uh, what our Indian government is doing because I am a representative of Indian government, even though it's not my ministry which is doing, a ministry called MNRI, they, uh, they are responsible for 
doing all these alternate energy sources, but I should really tell you with a lot of satisfaction that they are doing extremely well in moving to non energy, sorry, non conventional energy sources like wind and solar. They are investing a lot, and India is becoming more and more popular because of our investment in non conventional energy sources. For example, in the wind energy, we are fourth in the fourth best in the world. And uh, especially this uh, wind, uh, wind farms we can see, in, especially in Tamil Nadu, as well as Maharashtra, as well as to some places in Gujarat. Now Indian government is investing more on solar. Well, India is full of, uh, India is a tropical country, we can get a lot of solar energy, especially in uh, non-monsoon months, without the monsoon rains, we can get a lot of solar energy. So solar energy conversion plants are being uh, built everywhere. And uh, so that's at present the wind energy is about 49 percentage and solar is 31. This, this solar energy 31 will is going up every year because now solar panels, the, the cost of solar panels have reduced a lot. About 10 years back the cost of solar panels was very high, that's why we, we could not afford to make more solar plants. Now the solar pan plants, the panels have reduced the cost of solar panels. So we are in, moving more to solar energy. Now I will give uh, another four to five slides. So climate is changing, we are experiencing more and more heat wave with more and more uh, extreme weather events like heavy rainfall, flash floods, urban floods. You must be hearing about the uh, Chennai floods a few years back when people died. Bombay flood 2005 it was one of the good examples. So what the uh, is, what Ministry of Science is doing. So it's a big challenge to forecast, it's easy to forecast next tomorrow's rainfall. But it is very difficult to forecast extreme weather events because it's, it's a very different, science itself is a very different science. So we need to really have a strategy and I, I should really tell you with a lot of satisfaction again that we are investing a lot in terms of research and for example for developing the tools and application tools, models, observations to improve our forecast for extreme weather events. So I'll give you a few examples, I will not go in detail. One is we are going to have an, uh, we developed an early warning system for Chennai uh, flood. You might, probably I told you that 2015 we had a Chennai flood. So we developed, of course we, we developed with the help from uh, people in IIT Bombay, IIT Madras, Arna University. So it's a kind of joint collaboration. We did extremely good job for developing a, a flood warning system for Chennai. So with this, this we are going to go, give it to the Chennai government, sorry, the municipal corporation, which they will be using it for day-to-day -day purpose. The very idea is that after we developed, Chennai did not get any rights. Even last year, we are, expecting, we are expecting to validate this model to see whether the model is working or not. We are waiting every day, some rain, heavy rainfall will come, flood will come, but nothing happened. So probably after we develop the flood, <laughs> it will reduce. But uh, it can happen any any time, so we will be making use of this flood warning system. I am also happy to say that the same warning system we are going to develop for already start work started for Mumbai. So by next year monsoon season, we'll have our model, same modeling system, uh, modeling system for Mumbai flood for flood flood events. And uh, already we started putting our observations here. I will give an example. So these are the observations. First of all, we should know what is really happening. And then we can say that what will happen tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So we already started putting a lot of observations here. You can see these are all the engages. And uh, IIT Pune, Dr. Pandituri is here. He is leading this initiative. And uh, so, so many, we are going to put some more, uh, some more observations here. And we will be putting four radars, X-band radars in here, small radars, which can see up to over 550 to 60 kilometers. So if you have uh, four radars with the rain gauge network, we will be able to find out the actual rainfall happening at every 500 meter. We will be calculating, estimating the rainfall at every 500 meter in the Bombay city and also the new Bombay suburbs and which, which can we can update every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes we will be able to tell you every 500 meter what is the rainfall actually. So when flood event happens, flash flood or heavy rainfall events happen, people will like to know where it is raining. It may not be raining everywhere in the Bombay city. It may be raining in particular pockets. So this will be very useful for general public to, for some, if you want to go to one place, one place. If it's really raining there, people can avoid going there. And also the local municipal corporation can take actions accordingly. So we, this, uh, uh, this framework will be, by radar will come by next year. But this is already on, already on. And uh, Panditure has already developed a, a, a mobile app, is mobile app. And it is available for downloading. So I understand it is only for Android now. Android probably IO also it will come. 
and by another few months. Another is a heat wave forecast. We, as we know that heat waves are increasing, we have developed a prediction system for predicting heat waves. And we are, I should really tell you the heat wave forecast up to four to five days. We will be able to inform the people that up to beyond uh, next to four to five days a heat wave can ha happen and what could be the intensity of heat wave and how long, how long the heat wave will persist. And this we are doing it for the last three, four years. And I should tell you based on our heat wave forecast, many state government they have started an action, action plan called heat wave action plan. One good example is Gujarat. They have, it's called Ahmedabad Heat Action Plan, very famous plan, it is even internationally recognized. So based on our forecast, they have a definite strategy what to do. So municipal corporation is involved, school authorities involved, hospitals are involved, immediately hospitals will be informed, publics are informed. So everything is it's a very, very good strategy. And because of the, the, the deaths caused by, due to heat waves has drastically reduced for the last four or five years. Mainly because of we are able to forecast the heat wave events about four to five days. And we have many state governments, including Andhra, Orissa, they have very beautiful strategy of decision support system for heat wave management. Another is lightning. Lightning, Maharashtra, especially many people die in lightning, say, during, uh, because of lightning. So we have put up a lot of lightning. Earlier, the lightning network was available only for Maharashtra, which we have expanded. Again, the institute in Pune, they have put it. And they also developed a mobile app. Based on that, at any given time, you can, if you, if you really log in, you can see that uh, the next 15 minutes or next half an hour, a lightning can occur around your region, around your place. So if you have a mobile app, you can always see. And if a thunderstorm or lightning is going to happen within your, within your locality, it will be immediately alert. So this is also an important step which we have made. Another is our early warning system for air quality. People from Delhi only know how bad is our air quality in Delhi. So we have, uh, it's a, it is a, a direction given by none other than PM office. They told you develop a prediction system for, so which we again IATM scientists have developed this prediction system and we tested last year and it worked extremely well. So we are able to predict, of course, there's small problem in the, in the predicting the quantum of uh, air quality. For example, how much is the content of the air quality in aerosols. But we are able to see the trends. For example, if uh, low, low air quality, whether it can deteriorate, whether it can go up or it can go down. That kind of beautiful trends, we can predict it. And last year, we tested this uh, uh, early warning system for air quality, and it is improving well. And this year we will be launching it for some more states, some more places like Kanpur or like now uh, during this winter. So this is a good event, a good uh, prediction system which we have developed. And uh, so this is a good example how the predictions were made. And we are also doing a lot of research in terms of uh, atmospheric observations. Again, the Institute in Pune will be buying a, 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 say aircraft by next year. And with this aircraft, we will be making a lot of measurements. It's called National Facility for Airborne Research. Anybody, anybody who wants to do airborne research can use this aircraft. So we'll be buying aircraft by next year. This is the last slide. So let us make commitments to save our beautiful planet, blue planet. May not be for us, but for our children, our, our grandchildren. With this, I will start here. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Dr. Rajivan. We have already given a thunderous applause, but since I was not there, we'll do it once again. It's a common practice for the presiding person to say a few words, and I'm going to say only a few words. First of all, uh, I had uh, introduced uh, Dr. Rajivan as a hardcore scientist and a policy maker. When we hear a hardcore scientist, we get bored. When we hear a policy maker also, we don't understand much. But when we have a policy maker and a hardcore scientist, the result is what we have heard today. A beautiful talk, an interesting talk, and he has told us many things, of which I am just going to give a couple of remarks, not more than that. First of all, the one lesson that he has taught us today is don't worry about the monsoon. It is safe. This is something coming from him is, I think, a very reassuring statement that the monsoon is safe for all of us. Of course, the, the details of the monsoon are not that safe, so we have to worry about them. Second thing is uh, the Indian contribution to the international intergovernmental panel for climate change is coming very soon, which is also a, a very welcome piece of news. 
But uh, what he didn't tell you was, I'm going to tell you in a couple of sentences. Most of you who are sitting here, many of you who are sitting here, were born in the year 2000 or later. And demographic science says that everybody who was born in the year 2000 is going to live till the year 2100. This is what demographic science says, that all the younger citizens of today are going to live for a hundred years. There's a book about a hundred year life which I've been reading. So whatever Rajivan has told today, we are in a position to test it, whether what he has going to the forecast that he has made, whether they be true or false, you are going to be there to check it out for us. So please remember what the forecasts have been given for the next hundred years, the reassurances he has given, the worries that he has mentioned, the concerns that he has raised. It's for all of you to face in the, up to the year 2100. We'll have some questions and uh, I'm sure he'll be able to, or he will like some questions to be. Let me mention that there will be a press briefing afterwards. So if the journalists have something to know about the monsoon and its arrival, it's already answered, the monsoon has arrived, it's raining outside. So don't repeat that question again. But any other question which is about his topic today and his lecture, I'm sure he'll be able to answer. If, if you ask, you will coordinate, fine. Thank you, sir. Do you need your water? Do you need your water? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajivan, Dr. Kilkar. The floor is open for question answers. Uh, before we start with the Q&A, I just have one announcement. We have uh, representatives from different media houses and I request you all to please uh, follow our Head of Public Relations, Ms. Aditi Rajani, who is here right in the front. You can uh, be with Aditi. Uh, she can take you to another room where we have organized a press meet, a question answer session, exclusively for you all with Dr. Rajivan. Uh, may I request our young students and faculty to please ask questions and any comments that you have for the talk. I am, Dr. I am Dr. R. Vishama, retired deputy GM from IMD. It's not the question now, I just want to add one information. Like uh, early one is East of Chennai, I am based on Mumbai, they are trying now. But Karnataka has also developed early one is East from Bangalore city and it's operated for last three years. They have also developed Sitlu app for lightning as IMD has given and I am also registered for that even if I am in Mumbai. I get, do get the information about lightning around the, um, wherever I am going there. So, Karnataka has also developed a lot of uh, infrastructure in the uh, early warning and all those things. So, just want to add to Secretary's information, they have also done. That is, thank you. Sir. Next question. Please identify yourselves. So I am Chinmay Khanolkar. I am an assistant professor in Department of Environmental Science, KJS Home College of Science and Commerce. My question is, we saw many early warning systems, many apps being developed for uh, inland cities. My question is, have we developed anything for islands? Islands, Andaman, Nicobar, Lakshadweep, because these are the most vulnerable uh, parts of India for when it comes to climate change. Who wants the next one? If you could just raise your hands, we would be able to identify you. Yes, Sagar. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, myself, Sagar, Professor Sagar Marathe, uh, same from Department of Environmental Science, KJ Somaya College. Uh, we have been hearing a lot about monsoons and prediction for rainfalls. I would also like to know what our ministry is doing for other seasons as well, because what we have been observing is the seasons are shifting or they are getting prolonged or there is sudden change in the entire seasonal pattern. So, are there any predictions or any research going on in that direction as well? And what will, the, uh, will be the way ahead? So there, are, there are studies which show that monsoon uh, season, uh, whole call June to September, is not really June to September. It, uh, for some many places, monsoon onset is 
delayed, especially in northern parts, monsoon is delayed. But withdrawal also delayed, so the total duration of the monsoon period is same. But there are changes happening in terms of arrival of monsoon and going back, withdrawal also. And that which we, we are informing agriculture people because the, the sowing activity and all should be related to the monsoon onset. So we have been informing them, but if you take last 50 years of data, there is systematic changes in terms of monsoon arrival and going back. Hello, uh, hi everyone and thank you so much professors for your great uh, inputs and talks. So I am Ashwini Hingne, I am with the World Resources Institute India and I am a climate and economics researcher. <clears throat> so my question is actually not technical and the reason is also because a lot of times the topics like climate change uh, end up being very technocratic and this is something we observe as economists or scientists. And my question is essentially uh, given your experience in all of these years, how do you think that the climate conversation or can be actually enhanced in India? I mean, we, we have scientists talking about it, uh, but not enough people talking about it. Or the, the, the fact that you said that the impact of climate change will be so much more pronounced in India, even though we may not be emitting as much. So how can the larger public be more involved and engaged in this topic? And, Dr. Kelkar said uh, how the education system can come in, but also how can the conversation in the public arena can be improved? According to both of you all, I would like to hear. Thank you. Yeah, that is true. You are, you are really correct that uh, not many people are involved in uh, climate change discussion in this country. And a few years back, till maybe five, five, six years back, many people don't even accept the climate change is a reality. Even to some extent, even IMD was not accepted. Whenever something happened, oh, it's not part of climate change. Now only IMD also is coming out and saying that the climate change is happening. So we have some kind of hesitation to accept the climate change as a reality. But we should really change, number one. The people, not only even, even including scientists, people, there are very few people who are working on climate change science. But yeah, the good news is that many universities and uh, big academic institutions are starting new programs on climate change science. For example, Indian Soil Science has started the MDOC program on climate change science. And many universities, they started uh, climate change. Not only science of climate change, but especially the economics and adaptation, how to adapt the how adaptation technologies, for example, mitigation methods, this kind of thing. So climate change, as, as uh, Dr. Kelkres rightly told, it's not only science. It has a lot of implication on different sectors. For example, applications on uh, different sectors, how it will be affected. So I agree with you that very few, very few people are working, but uh, things are changing. Definitely more and more people are getting involved. But also, I personally feel that more and more NGOs should come forward. NGOs should come forward, and institutions like WRA and all should really get involved in climate change. It's a hot topic, but government is committed to help the especially MOES is very committed to help everybody who want, especially economic institution, even NGO we can support uh, any, if we want to start any program on climate change science or uh, climate change policies, we will be very happy to support. I'll just add to your his comment to your question. Speaking in Marathi, there is a word called Havaman Badal, which is very common in Maharashtra, in Marathi and in Mumbai. The problem in Marathi is that there is no difference in Marathi between weather and climate. And these days, anything which happens in, in Maharashtra is immediately reported as Havaman Badal. Actually, it's a weather fluctuation. It's not a climate change at all. So this is something that needs to be actually kind of uh, spread away, spread over the, the discussions that everything, any change, little change that you see has not become a permanent change. It's a temporary thing. But as you said, uh, there should be a conversation and the conversation should be in, in different levels, schools, colleges, uh, institutions and, and so on. But uh, this is a long term affair and as I said, it's for people who are born in 2000 and going to spend the next century on this planet. They should worry more than people like me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Dr. Suresh Shukrande, Principal of KS Home Institute of Engineering and Information Technology, Science Campus. Uh, your presentation, you said uh, uh, Antarctica and Arctic uh, Ocean, I mean, uh, after melting, you will not be there in 2050 or so. And you mentioned about some water level rise, sea level rise. 
Uh, more specifically, wh what I want to know is what will happen to the coastal cities. Uh, more specific, like Bangkok, what we read in uh, literature, or Mumbai. And second question about, is there any uh, fear of tsunami to India in near future? I'll, ask the, I'll answer the second question first, that uh, I don't know about tsunami, because tsunami is not nothing related to climate change. It's a natural process because earthquake happens under the sea water. And, uh, so, but we cannot tell when tsunami, next tsunami will happen. Only we should pray that tsunami should not come. And uh, the first question is regarding sea level rise. It is happening in many places, the, especially sea erosion is happening, erosion is happening. And in many coastal areas, we have taken observation for the last 20 years using satellite data. And we have seen many coastal areas of sea erosion is happening mainly because of the sea level rise. So already the sea level, uh, sea level rise has uh, started affecting the sea coast, especially the uh, east coast, especially for example places like Puducherry, Vishagapatnam, that area, already sea erosion is happening. And it is going to increase. I am D.G. Fundaker from KSO Maya College of Science and, Science and Commerce. My question is, when the climate change will take place, the temperature perhaps will rise. The impact of that will be universal. Number two, the flow of water will be from polar areas to equatorial areas because of the rotation. So there will be impact on coastal areas, not only rising sea level, but also the flow of water in the agricultural areas. And that will be a saline water, number one. Number two, because of rising temperature, there will be impact on organism, particularly biochemical structure of the organism. So whether the government is having or initiated such kind of research programs, because that will directly influence on health, health of people as well as animal. Uh, 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 animal. So are there sur certain programs initiated for the next near future? I agree with you. This uh, because of climate, I, I did not discuss here. Is uh, changes uh, can come in biodiversity, <coughs> and uh, especially in biological systems it can have effect. Especially marine systems it can have an effect. So we have uh, our ministry is a, a center in Kochi, it's a center for marine research, marine living resources. They are doing a lot of work on uh, how the global warming can affect the marine biodiversity. They are doing a lot of research. They taking ship. They have we have ships. We have five ships. So one of the ship we take every year and take measurements in the ship and also we take the marine mammals and etc. and see the, how the ch ch things are changing in the marine biodiversity. And that, uh, so many, many universities are also doing, for example, Anamalai University has a beautiful program on marine biodiversity, marine biology program. So many universities are doing it. So it's a good aspect, but of course I did not discuss in detail. If it's, there's no further questions, thank you very much once again, Dr. Rajivan, Dr. Kelkar, a huge round of applause. Thank you, sir. May I now invite? Okay, before. All right. Aditi wants to move with the press. If you all can just stand up and accompany Aditi. So she'll take you to the room where you will have the press meet. Representatives from the press. Thank you. May I request Lieutenant General Jagbir Singh to please come and deliver the word of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. A subject of great contemporary concern, if I may say so. Because uh, we all talk about climate change. The importance that is given to it varies from society to society and country to country. I mean, a society which is, survive, which is fighting for survival, which is fighting for its daily sustenance, lays little store in climate change issues. But the problem is it is that society which suffers the effects of climate change also the most. So we need to be very aware of what is happening. 
Like Dr. Kelker said, the Nobel Prize for Peace went for climate change. And we hear a lot about water wars. You know, we're going to be wars in future, not for territory, not for land, but for resources. And that is where all these effects will come in. You see today, Chennai has no water. And that's the irony of what was stated. In 2015 December, there were Chennai floods. In within 36 hours, two feet of water came down, and I can say that because the overall responsibility for uh, flood relief operations was listed with the Army, and I was the head of the entire southern area at that point in time. So, and it happened not because of apathy on the part of anybody who was responsible for it, though the media thereafter did a lot of blame and, you know, straight catch hold of the bureaucrats to say they did not release water in time. And when the media made so much of noise about it, as the news about that there's going to be more rain further on, there's going to be heavy rain around 31st of December, the district collectors down south, further south of Chennai, started releasing water. And my concern at that time to the Chief Secretary Tamil Nadu was, the way this is going, I hope there is normal monsoon next year, otherwise there will be drought. And that's what happened. So, we all need to be aware we don't, we need to be aware about what is there and it's up to this generation, you youngsters out here, who have to spread this. We have to be responsible. Like, I think it was Mahatma Gandhi once said, that the earth has enough for everybody's needs, but not enough for everybody's greed or man's greed. Right, so we have to have an ecological stability and, you know, environmental balance which has to be maintained. And small things. Like some years ago, hill stations had no fans. Today, which, with rising temperature, not only fans, there are air conditioners in hill stations. We use air conditioners when it, even when we don't need to. You know, you'd sleep with a blanket, but with the AC on. Right. So, I mean, these are issues that we all need to be very, very aware of. This is what is contributing in no small measure. Our cities are overpopulated. And it is these, if we are not aware, if we are not ready to spread awareness about climate change, we are in for trouble, and we are in for serious trouble. Dr. Rajivan said, rain will be there, rain will be normal, monsoon will be there, but it will be in spurts. It will happen over periods of three, four days. There will be dry spells for about ten days, maybe more. It's not just the quantity of monsoon that's important. What is important thereafter is how do you retain that water? If you're going to let that water flow out into the sea, into the rivers, it's of no use. So farmers have to look at it, they need to look as to how they're going to harvest, how they're going to retain that water, so that water is available even if there is no rain. It's happened now, we've seen in Dahanu, as a matter of fact, in the last, since Diwali last year, there have been tremors. And nobody has been able to find out the cause as to why there are tremors, though they have been at the seismic level of three or so. But they've been recurring, and they've been recurring at intervals of maybe daily until the last 15, 20 days are no longer there now. But as a result of it, the wells in the area dried up. It's like the aquifers just dried up. So what is all this activity which is going on, tectonic activity below the surface of the earth? We all need to be aware, and that's why water harvesting is something which is very, very important. Because rain will come, water will be there, glaciers, glaciers, melting of glaciers, they are the largest source of water. The glaciers melt, we will have no reserves, we'll have no reserves. Those are reservoirs from which water will come, and without water, human race cannot survive. It's something which is absolutely essential. So I would implore all you youngsters here, your generation, as Dr. Kelker said, you're going to live to be 100, you're going to see a lot, but you're going to live to be 100 if all resources and everything that nature provides to us remain. So that is the most important thing that we need to carry from here today. On behalf of Shri Samir Sumaya, President of uh, Sumaya Vidya Vihar, I'd like to thank Dr. Rajin for having taken time out from his very, very busy schedule to be here with us today and to enlighten us on certain issues which the government is seized of 
and various measures that are being taken to see that in our country we are able to meet anything in the future which nature may throw at us. It's like, you know, America, Donald Trump suddenly says climate change is not an effect of climate change. It's all very good. Like I said, it's the Western countries which really don't bear or will not bear the effect of. For them, temperature rise today when in England you talk to somebody, he says it's 17 degrees very warm. 17 degrees like here is winter. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of effect. But that's okay. It's okay for them. It doesn't make much of a difference. But for us, it makes a lot. This year also you will have read temperature in so many cities and so many Towns in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh have gone over 50 degrees, which wasn't heard about two years ago. So we need to be careful about this. I won't take uh, more of your time, but there's something which is, uh, we all need to be very, very aware of and conscious of. Uh, I'd also like to thank Dr. Kerikar for enlightening us, being here, taking, taking time, out, time out to be with us and uh, with his presence. Once again, I thank Dr. Rajivan, Dr. Kelkar, and each one of you who are here for this lecture. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. With this, we come to a close of today's uh, function. May I ask all of you to please rise for the National Anthem. I will request Dr. Vina Salvi to please come and lead us in the National Anthem. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your passion. It's great. Thank you.